You're live with Euronews as we wait for Russian President Vladimir Putin to address both houses in the Russian parliament. In a special session that's been called about the situation in Crimea, the delegation of Crimea's new leaders are also attending. Earlier today, Putin informed parliament formally of Crimea's request to join the Russian Federation, which is the first legal step towards absorbing Crimea. Putin also signed an order yesterday morning recognizing Crimean independence. He's also approved a draft bill on the accession. Session's been called after the referendum on Sunday, in which Crimean officials say 97% of voters backed splitting for Ukraine. The figures you can see at the, on the front row are the new leaders of Crimea. The lady there is the Speaker of the House. She's now a subject of US and EU sanctions and frozen assets and visa bans. So the EU and the US have declared the vote in Crimea illegal and, as I mentioned, imposed these sanctions, which include travel bans and asset freezes. Kiev has appealed to the international community not to recognize the result of the vote. There are 83 autonomous republics currently that are part of the Russian Federation, and Crimea would become the 84th. So, so far, 21 Russians and Ukrainians are the subject of sanctions by the EU and the US. The EU has said that the list is not limited to these people and could eventually include up to 120, 130 senior officials and politicians and business people and military commanders in Russia. So the formalities of making Crimea a part of the Russian Federation are expected to be completed by the 21st of March. But Russian ministers have said that the whole process could technically take two to three years. The man you can see in front of you now is the mayor of Moscow. Crimea's new parliament announced that as of the 1st of April, the currency in Crimea would be the Russian ruble. So we're waiting for Russian President Vladimir Putin to address both houses of the Russian parliament. That's the lower house, the State Duma, and the upper house, the Federation Council, in a special session that's been called after the referendum in Crimea voted in favor of Crimea becoming a part of Russia. Putin's expected to ask both houses to support a draft law which would incorporate Crimea as part of the Federation. Earlier today, he informed Parliament formally of Crimea's request to join the country, which is the first legal step towards the peninsula becoming part of Russia. In front of you, it says the address of the Russian President Vladimir Putin. So we're expecting him to arrive now in the next few minutes. He's going to be addressing both houses in the Russian parliament in a special session that's been called over Crimea. We're announcing his arrival. Putin. The President of the Russian Federation, Putin, is arriving. Please, take a seat, Putin says.
Good afternoon, esteemed members of the Federation Council and members of the State Duma. And esteemed representatives of the Republic of Crimea, the Russian citizens, citizens of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol. His comments clearly receiving loud applause and now a standing ovation. So he's called there the people of Crimea, the citizens of Russia, which has drawn the standing ovation and applause. Thank you, Putin says. Dear friends, we've gathered today to discuss the question which is of vital and historic importance for all of us. On the 17th of March, there was a referendum in Crimea, although in fact it was on the 16th of March. And the referendum was totally in line with international law. 82% turnout and 96% in favour of joining Russia. Those figures are absolutely convincing, Putin says. In order to understand why they made this choice, one has to know the history of Crimea. One has to know what Crimea means to Russia. In Crimea, everything is saturated with our joint history. The ancient town of Hersonessus, where Prince Vladimir took Christianity a thousand years ago. And this choice to accept Christianity is what unites the people of Russia, Ukraine and Belarus. The graves of Russian soldiers are in Crimea, soldiers who died in the mid-19th century in the war against Turkey and England and France. And of course, Sevastopol is a city of Russian glory where the Russian Black Sea Fleet is based, the Russian naval force. The cities of Balakava and Kersh in Crimea, sacred places to Russia and sacred to the Russian people. Crimea is an amalgamation of cultures and traditions and different peoples and is so similar and to what the Russian Federation is, where so many different nations and nationalities live together. Russians and Ukrainians and Tatars have always lived shoulder to shoulder together in Crimea. Crimea, preserving their own religions and their own traditions. There are one and a half ethnic million Russians in Crimea. And Ukrainians who still use Russian as their first language. And almost 100,000 Crimean Tatars, and many of them support joining Russia. Yes, it's a black page in history when Crimean Tatars were the subject of repression. But of course, we have to remember there was a time when so many different nations suffered. And Crimean Tatars are not alone in that. So the process of rehabilitation of Crimean Tatars will be finished when Crimea joins Russia and we grant them full rights. We will restore their good name and their good historical past. It's their birthplace. And we want the Crimean Tatars to know that we will support them 
And of course, we will support the idea of having three official languages in Crimea, Russian, Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar language. Dear colleagues, in people's minds and hearts, Crimea always has been and is now a part of Russia. And from generation to generation, People gave this knowledge of Crimea being a Russian land and any geopolitical changes and dramatic transformations in the former Soviet Union didn't change that. During the Bolshevik years in the 1920s, um, we won't analyze the reasons, but the Bolsheviks gave traditional Russian lands in the east and south of Ukraine to Ukrainian, the Ukrainian Socialist Republic. And then in 1954, the then authorities gave Crimea to Ukraine. The initiator was the leader of the Communist Party, Nikita Khrushchev. We don't know why he did it. Maybe he tried to hide his own personal responsibility for repressions in Ukraine in the 1930s. That's for historians to decide. But for us, it's clear that that decision was unconstitutional and illegal at the time. It was taken in a totalitarian state. Nobody asked the people of Crimea and the citizens of Sevastopol. Of course, many people have asked since then, why is Crimea in Ukraine? But I have to say, that the decision people were taking as a formality because there were no separate countries like Russia and Ukraine. They were living in one country, the Soviet Union. And we couldn't even imagine that Russia and Ukraine one day would be independent and different countries. Unfortunately, it became a reality. The Soviet Union collapsed and disintegrated. And history was moving so fast that people couldn't really understand and analyze the dramatic effect of what was happening. People in Russia and Ukraine and other former Soviet republics we're hoping that the new formation, the new Commonwealth of Independent States, would simply replace the Soviet Union. They were promised joint currency, joint armed forces, foreign policy. But they were just unfulfilled hopes. And a big joint federation simply disappeared. And when Ukraine illegally appeared as a different country, a foreign country, then Russia felt that it was robbed and it was cheated. But we have to admit that Russia contributed to the disintegration of the Soviet Union. And of course, in those turbulent years, people forgot about Crimea. People forgot about Sevastopol. Millions of ethnic Russians went to bed in one country and woke up in a different country. But Russian people became one of the biggest, if not the biggest, divided people in the world. Because ethnic Russians started living in many different countries. I've heard a lot of Crimea citizens say that in 1991, Crimea was given to Ukraine like a sack of potatoes. And of course, I can agree. And what did Russia do at that time? We swallowed our pride. Our country was in such a bad condition that we weren't in a position to defend our interests at that time. But people could still not take this historic injustice. And for all those years, the people, the citizens, the famous people in Russia, they always said that Crimea is historically Russian land and Sevastopol is a Russian city.
исходить. And of course, yes, we understood with our hearts and minds. На новой базе. But we had to take into account the realities of politics. Украины. А отношения с Украиной. And we had to develop good neighborly relations with Ukraine. Остаются и всегда будут для нас. And of course. Ключевыми без всякого преувеличения. And the relations were and will always be key and important for us. That's no exaggeration. It's of the utmost importance to preserve good relations with Ukrainian, our Ukrainian brothers. I can share with you the details of some of the negotiations in early 2000. With the then president of Ukraine, Kuchma, we were discussing how to speed up the process of delimitation of the state border between Russia and Ukraine, because the process wasn't moving along. But I instructed all the Russian agencies to intensify their work. To put actual limits on the borders with Russia and Ukraine, we understood at that time that if we completed the process of making the borders, we would lose Crimea forever. We also discussed the division of territorial waters in the Sea of Azov. We took into account at that time that the most important for us at that time was to preserve good brotherly relations between Ukraine and Russia. But of course, we assume that Ukraine will remain our closest ally, that ethnic Russian-speaking people in the east of Ukraine will live together with brotherly Russia and that all their rights are respected according to international law. But as the situation started to develop in a different way, to assimilate ethnic Russians into Ukrainian society, to deprive the ethnic Russians of their historical knowledge of their language. And of course, those people were suffering from a permanent, the permanent crisis that's been going on in Ukraine for the last 20 years. I understand why people in Ukraine wanted change. In those years of independence, the authorities in Ukraine were so bad that people got sick of them, got tired of them. The prime ministers and presidents came and went, but there was no difference. They all tried to rob Ukraine, to steal from the people of Ukraine. They were fighting for money, for budget money, for resources. And the authorities never actually cared about the millions of ordinary people. This is why so many people from Ukraine, millions of them, goers, guest workers to many countries abroad. Only in Russia last year, we had at least 3 million Ukrainians as guest workers who were coming to Russia looking for jobs. And they transferred so much money back to Ukraine, almost 12% of Ukrainian GDP. I want to say it once again, I understand those people who were at the Maidan, who wanted to protest against poverty, against the lack of democracy, and the lack of transparency, and against dictatorship. But there are legitimate procedures like elections to change authorities. But those who were behind the last events in Kiev, they had different aims and goals. They organized a coup d'etat and to grab power without any legal procedures. They used terror and pogroms and using weapons and arms. The initiators of that coup d'etat were nationalists, anti-Semites, radicals and people who hate Russians. This is why they tried to change the language law that deprived ethnic minorities in Ukraine 
of human rights. And of course, the sponsors of those so-called authorities in the West, they said, yes, they're clever people. So they said to the new Ukrainian authorities, don't try ethnic cleansing in Ukraine. So the law was cancelled so far to deprive the ethnic minorities of using their languages. So in Ukraine, people don't mention now about that law, probably hoping that people will forget. But for everyone, it is understandable what they want. They're the followers of the nationalists and the Nazi collaborator Bandera. And it's clear that there's no legitimate authority in Ukraine until now. We don't have anyone to talk to. They call themselves the new leaders, but they don't control anything in the new country. They're controlled themselves by radicals. Even to get an appointment with some ministers of the so-called new Ukrainian government, you have to get permission from the radicals in Maidan and from armed gangs, the armed gangs who initiated Maidan. And of course, they want to expand their radical actions to different parts of Ukraine. The first target was Crimea. And this is why the authorities of Crimea asked the Russian authorities to defend them and help them and protect them. We saw what was happening in eastern Ukraine, in Donetsk. And of course, we couldn't abandon our people in Crimea. Otherwise, we would have been traitors. We couldn't reject their pleas for help, for protection. This is why we decided to help them. We have to ensure the proper conditions for self-determination so that the citizens of Crimea could organize a free vote. And what we hear from our partners in Europe and in America, that we violated international law, well, it's a good thing that at least they remember there is such a thing as international law. Better late than never. And the most important thing, what are we violating? Yes, the president of the Russian Federation got approval from the upper house of the Russian parliament to use armed forces in Ukraine, but we didn't use this right. The Russian forces did not go to Crimea. We had legitimate Black Sea fleet in Crimea already, but we didn't send extra troops. Yes, we sent some reinforcement, but the permitted maximum level of our troops is 24,000, and we didn't even reach that limit. When the Crimea authorities declare the referendum, they quoted the United Nations Charter. It allows the self-determination of every people. And I want to remind you that when Ukraine decided to become independent, they did the same thing. They had a referendum in Ukraine in 1990, and now they deny the people of Crimea one. Why? Besides, there is a so-called Kosovo precedent that was created by the Western world. And the situation was absolutely identical to what's happening in Crimea. They separated Kosovo from Serbia and made it independent. And this is why there's no need for any part of the country to be recognized as independent. This is according to the United Nations. That was the argument of our Western partners in the case of Kosovo. In 2010, now quoting the resolution of the United Nations, 
более международное право не содержит каких-либо запрета на провозглашение независимости. Все, как говорится, ban ясно. Я не люблю обращаться к цитатам, но any territory from proclaiming and declaring its independence, so it's so clear. I don't really like a lot of quotes and quotations, but still, but still I'll quote something else. It's a memorandum from the United States when they applied to the International Criminal Court to support the idea of Kosovo's independence. Однако это не означает, что происходит нарушение международных правил. And they were trying to bend everyone. The and now they have the audacity to criticize us. We can't understand it. And what the Crimean people did is what they did is totally in line with international law. So what the ethnic Albanians did in Kosovo was legitimate, and what the Russians and Ukrainians and Tatars did in Crimea is illegitimate. Why? Now we hear from the United States that this is a special case, but what's so special in this case? The difference, they say to us, is that during the conflict in Kosovo, there were a lot of victims, there was genocide. But is it really a legitimate argument? There's no such thing in international law. And it's not even double standards. It's just so primitive and so cynical now. You can't just bend international law to your own interests. Yesterday they were calling something white, and today they're calling it black. So do you want every local conflict to have mass victims? I must say sincerely, there would have been a lot of victims had the self-defense of Crimea taken the peninsula under their control. Thank goodness it didn't happen. There wasn't a single military confrontation in Crimea and there were no victims in Crimea. Why is this? The answer is simple. Because it's very difficult to fight against the people and the people's will. Not just difficult, but almost impossible. And this is why I want to thank the Ukrainian military personnel in Crimea. And there are 22,000 Ukrainian troops in Crimea. I want to thank them for not starting to fire for not starting any bloodshed. They avoided military confrontation. And they didn't put bloodstains on them. And now it's being talked about that it was an intervention and aggression in Crimea. It's very strange for me. I haven't heard a single example in history where intervention or aggression took place without a single shot fired. So what happened in Crimea is a reflection of what happened in the world in the last couple of decades. There's no balance in the world anymore. Many of our partners in the West, especially the United States of America, they think not in terms of international law and right and wrong. They think about the right of might, the right of arms, the right of the, the one with strength. They create coalitions on the principle that those who are not with us are against us. They press international organizations to adopt documents and resolutions. That's what happened in Yugoslavia. 
глазам. And we remember it very well. Но в конце 20 века по одной It was difficult to believe what happened then. В течение нескольких недель наносились ракетно-бомбовые удары. But at the end of the 20th century, one of the European capitals, Belgrade, became an object of artillery and bombing and shelling. And then what happened? Did we have a UN resolution allowing it? No. No UN resolutions. What happened next? Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya. There was a resolution for a no-flight zone above Libya. And what happened? They started firing and bombing. So people in those areas are just sick and tired of being forced and being influenced and intimidated by the mighty United States and, their, and its allies. Instead of democracy and freedom, there is chaos, coup d'etats, the so-called Arab Spring. The Arab Spring has now turned into Arab Winter. The same scenario was realized in Ukraine in 2004. The so-called Orange Revolution, when they entered the third round of presidential elections, it's absurd. It Мы понимаем, что происходит. Понимаем, что эти действия были And now they've created a well-equipped army of thugs and radicals and neo-Nazis. Это в то время, когда Those actions were against Russia. с нашими коллегами на Мы постоянно against the integration of the post-Soviet area. Вопрос. Хотим укреплять And this is happening when Russia was offering dialogue and peace to everyone. We want to strengthen mutual trust. Но мы не видим We want the relations to be with everyone to be open and transparent and honest. But we didn't have any reciprocal steps taken. The decisions were taken behind our backs. This was the case with NATO expansions to the east, the siphoning of military infrastructure at our borders. And they say, oh, it has nothing to do with you. Well, what do you mean it has nothing to do with us? Having military, the military might of NATO on our borders. They promised us visa liberalization. They promised us trade concessions. They promised us a lot of things regarding industrial cooperation, and it hasn't happened. For example, in the times of the so-called Cold War, the United States banned the sales of sensitive equipment to the then Soviet Union. They lifted those restrictions, but only in theory, and it still goes on. Those unbalanced policies towards Russia still remain. We're punished for having our independent position. That we're not hypocritical, we're open and transparent. And now, in the case of Ukraine, they just crossed the line. Western states just crossed the line. They were irresponsible and aggressive. They knew perfectly well that in Ukraine and in Crimea there are a lot of Russian people, a lot of Russian-speaking people. They've lost any sense of political understanding. They didn't predict the Russian reaction. You know, when you try to push the spring a lot, the spring will sooner or later recoil in your face. You have to stop your hysteria and just admit that Russian, Russia is independent, active and strong and a member of the international community. It has its own legitimate interests that have to be respected and taken into account. We are already thankful, of course, to those 
who understood our actions and our activities in Crimea. For example, to China. To China, whose leadership whose leadership wants to understand the situation in Ukraine with all of its complexity and multifaceted realities. Also, India, who is trying to be neutral and objective. I also want to address the Americans, the United States. For them, freedom is above all. So why is the desire of the people of Crimea to be free? That's less valid than the sense of Americans to be free. You have to understand us, I hope, that the Germans and Europeans will understand us. And I can remind you that when East and West Germany were united, there were some objections. People who thought the idea of reunification of East and West wasn't a good idea. But our country supported it fully. Yes, you have to become a reunified country again. Well, I hope that you haven't forgotten this. And I hope that you, the Germans, will now support the idea of Russian unity, the Russian world, the restoration of the historic Russian lands. I hope you'll support us. I also address the people of Ukraine. I honestly want you to understand us. We don't want to humiliate you. We don't want to harm you. We always respected the unity of Ukraine. But it's those who support Ukrainian nationalism that are responsible for the, the split in Ukraine. Please don't trust those who now try to scare you that after Crimea, new territories will go to Russia. This is not true. But as to Crimea, Crimea always was Russian and Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar. And it will remain as such always, as it used to be for centuries. It will be a home for all nations, but it will never be Nazi Bandera, a reference to an alleged Nazi collaborator from Western Ukraine. That was President Putin receiving strong applause there from the two houses at the Russian parliament. It continues. Crimea is our joint effort. It's a strategic territory. And the territory has to become part of stable, strong an international player, and such a player can only be Russia today. Otherwise, dear friends, all of us, Russians and Ukrainians, can lose Crimea altogether. If you do not accept what happened, we can lose Crimea altogether. I have to remind you that already we have calls from Ukraine to join NATO. What does it mean? What does that mean for Russia and Crimea? That in Sevastopol, the city of Russian glory, there would be NATO warships. And this could have happened in reality.
but for the choice of the Crimean people, and we thank them for that. Crimea cannot be part of NATO. Кстати говоря, мы не против сотрудничества с НАТО. Совсем нет. By the way, we're not against cooperation with NATO, but we're against the military alliance. We're против того, чтобы военная организация хозяйничала возле наших возле нашего забора, рядом с нашей с нашим домом или на наших исторических территориях. Вы знаете, we're strictly against the foreign military alliance. And then becoming masters in our historic territories. I can't even imagine that we could travel to Crimea as guests to NATO military personnel. By the way, many of them are good guys, good people, but I'd rather that they come to us as guests. Of course. I'm suffering personally. My heart bleeds for people in Crimea, for what's happening now in Crimea. I've said many times that we're practically one people. Kiev is the mother of Russian cities historically. The ancient Rus is our joint source. We couldn't live without one another, never or ever. Millions of ethnic Russians, Russian-speaking people will live in Ukraine, and Russia will always defend their interests with political, diplomatic and legal means. Always. But, first of all, Ukraine itself should be interested to guarantee the interests and rights of those people, and that will guarantee stability of Ukraine, of Ukrainian integrity and territorial unity. We want friendship with Ukraine. We want it to be strong and stable. It's one of our most important partners in the economy and everything, in culture. And we believe in the success of the Ukrainian people. We wish them peace and prosperity. And we will offer our hand. We offer all our assistance to help Ukraine. But again, it's for the people of Ukraine to bring, put their house in order. Dear people of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol, the whole of Russia was applauding your courage and your actions. It was you, the people, who decided your own destiny. We're close as never before. We've supported each other. And there are sincere feelings of solidarity. And such historic moments are testing. Well, it's difficult to gauge the soul of the people. And the people of Russia showed solidarity and inner strength when supporting their brothers in Crimea. The strong position of Russia on foreign relations was based on the wishes and feelings of millions of Russians. And I want to thank all Russians for this patriotic feeling. And it's important for us to preserve this consolidated feeling. Of course, we'll have some obstacles now in the world, but for us, we have to decide once and for all whether we'll stand firm or surrender. Now some Western countries threaten not only sanctions, but they predict economic troubles and inner troubles in Russia. I don't understand what they mean. Because this is quite aggressive, and we will, we will react to this very strongly. I want to repeat again, we're not seeking confrontations with our partners in the West or in the East. We will do our best 
to build and maintain good, friendly relations. As is the general rule of international coexistence now. So there was a clear choice in Crimea, whether they wanted to be with Russia or with Ukraine. And it was very clear that when they were formulating these questions on the referendum, they were putting the interests of people and not political ambitions at the forefront. Any other form of referendum would have been would have been only interim and not very solid and it would have led again to some further confrontations and it would affect people so so the Crimeans decided to put the question very clearly the referendum was open, fair and transparent and honest and people in Crimea gave a strong answer they want to be with Russia. For Russia, it's still necessary to take very difficult decisions because of internal and, of course, external factors. In our society, there are different points of view. But the absolute majority of people are absolutely clear. You know, in all the opinion polls of the last few days, almost 95% of our people confirm that the Russian state has to protect the interests of Russian-speaking people and ethnic Russians in Crimea and in other areas. And they agree that Russia has to do it even if our actions might complicate our relations with some countries. 86% of our citizens are still convinced that Crimea is historically, historically Russian land. And one more important figure, almost 92%, 92% support the idea of Crimea joining the Russian Federation. So, the absolute majority of Crimean people and the absolute majority of people in the Russian Federation support the idea of reunification of Crimea and Sevastopol with the Russian Federation. Russian President Vladimir Putin receiving a standing ovation there from both houses of the Russian Parliament. He's just addressed about the situation in Crimea, explaining that Crimea has historically, in the minds of Russians, always been part of Russia. Putin continues, now it's up to the politi a political decision of Russia itself. And this political decision can only be based on the will of the people, because only the people are the source of governance. So it seems... So esteemed members of parliament and citizens of Crimea, based on the results of the referendum and based on the will of the people, I ask Parliament to consider the draft law 
asking the Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol to join the Russian Federation. That would be the draft law which I ask you to support. Ратифицировать подготовленный для подписания договор о вхождении Республики Крым и города Севастополь в Российскую Федерацию. Не сомневаюсь. Поддержки. I ask you to support the ratification of the agreement about Crimea joining the Russian Federation. That was President Putin addressing the Russian Parliament. So Putin has just asked Parliament to consider a draft law. So they're now expected to sign a draft treaty, which has already been ratified. It's about the Republic of Crimea, which has proclaimed its independence, and Sevastopol as a separate entity to join the Russian Federation. This is the speakers of both Houses of Parliament and the Prime Minister. So President Putin has now left stage, left the stage together with the Speaker of the Crimean Parliament and the new Prime Minister of Crimea and the Mayor of Sevastopol, the self-proclaimed Mayor of the city of Sevastopol. They went off stage and it's understood that they will be at a signing ceremony either in the same hall or, or nearby, it's expected to be broadcast from there, a signing ceremony. So as of now, there are 83 autonomous republics, 83 subjects that are part of the Russian Federation. The Republic of Crimea will become number 84, and the city of Sevastopol will become number 85 as a separate entity. In Ukraine, the city of Sevastopol was already a separate legal entity and the Autonomous Republic of Crimea was part of Ukraine and the city of Sevastopol was a separate entity within the Ukrainian legal framework. And apparently this is what's going to be happening within the Russian Federation. So both Crimea and the city of Sevastopol will be joining the Russian Federation. It follows the referendum in controversial referendum in Crimea at the weekend where Crimean officials say that 97% of the population or 97% of those who voted were in favor of Crimea joining the Russian Federation. We've been watching President Putin address both houses of parliament about Crimea becoming a part of the Federation and he asked ministers to consider signing the draft law and to sign the draft treaty which would bring Crimea and the city of Sevastopol under the Russian Federation. Дамы и господа, мы продолжаем наше мероприятие, поэтому просьба занять свои места. So earlier on, Russian President Vladimir Putin talked about the historical significance of Crimea to Russia and how it always remained part of 
the collective, collective consciousness that it was a part of Russia, that Russian soldiers were buried there and that ethnic Russians lived there. So the referendum on Sunday was, of course, controversial. Crimean officials said that 97% of voters back splitting with Ukraine. The EU and the US declared it illegal and have begun imposing sanctions on various government officials and other figures in Russia, Crimea and Ukraine. They include travel bans and asset freezes. So now they're preparing to sign the formal treaty, an already ratified formal treaty about Crimea and the city of Sevastopol to join the Russian Federation. Making Crimea the 84th subject of the Russian Federation and Sevastopol the 85th. Ukraine, of course, appealed to the international community not to recognize the result of the vote in Crimea. That's the president of Chechnya there. A former rebel who switched sides to Putin and is now seen as a hero of Russia, one of the most ardent of Putin's supporters. So the music's playing now. We're expecting the return of Putin and new leaders of Crimea for a signing ceremony. There are the flags of the Russian Federation and the flag of Crimea and the flag of the city of Sevastopol. The ceremony, the signing ceremony is about to start. That was the announcement. There's Putin to his left is the Speaker of the Crimean Parliament and to his right, the taller man, is the Prime Minister of Crimea. And the final man, the one not wearing a tie in black, is the Mayor of Sevastopol, the self-proclaimed Mayor of Sevastopol. Президент Российской Федерации Владимир Владимирович Путин, председатель Государственного Совета Республики Крым, парламента Республики Крым Владимир Андреевич Константинов и председатель Совета Министров Республики Крым Сергей Валерьевич Аксенов, уполномоченные представители Республики Крым, Алексей Михайлович Чалый, уполномоченный представитель города Севастополя подписывают договор между Российской Федерацией и Республикой Крым о принятии в Российскую Федерацию Республики Крым в составе Российской Федерации новых субъектов and the city of Sevastopol.
Russia, left to right, the Prime Minister of Crimea, the Speaker of Crimea, Vladimir Putin, and the self-proclaimed Mayor of Sevastopol. Of course, receiving much applause, as you can hear and see there. The referendum on Crimea was declared illegal by Ukraine, by the EU and by the US. The Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol have been signed, signed in by law to become a part of the Russian Federation, making them the 84th and the 85th autonomous republic to be a part of the Federation, with 83 already existing. Well, earlier, Putin addressed both houses in the Russian parliament, telling them why Crimea was so important to Russia, how historically it had always been thought of as part of Russia and how it had now returned. Time now to take a look at some more of today's news.